take us to the mountain. So take us to the mountain. Lift us in the shadow of your hand. Lift us in the shadow of your hand. Is this your mighty angel? He stands astride the ocean and the land. For in his hand your mercy showers on a dry and barren place. Take us to the mountain. In the city of our God, for the spirit of the sovereign Lord, for the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. The spirit. your salvation to win this generation for our King song of your forgiveness for it is with grace that river flows take us to the river in the city of our God take us to the throne room in the city of our God Take us to the throne room in the city of our God and take us to the mountain. Take us to the mountain in the city of our God. Thank you that when your son died in Calvary, you made a way clear. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, that we might go forward, go into the Holy of Holies and worship at your throne. So Lord, we come this morning, the beginning of this day, and it is our purpose and our desire to worship and praise you, as you would have us worship and praise you, Lord. Be with us, and just as we've drawn near to you, Lord, Lord, we pray that out of your grace and mercy, you would draw near to us this day. Bless your holy.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope Baptist Church this morning. Uh, very warm welcome. I, I had to get used to this in the age of uh, post-COVID, of welcoming people who were in the church building, but also online. And I'm told the correct thing is those that are on site and online. That's apparently the new terminology. So that apparently, that's what I'm told. So welcome to those of you who are on site. It's lovely to see you. And those of you who are online, we're very glad to have you with us this morning and hope you will feel part of uh, our worship together. I'm going to start uh, with what might seem an unusual reading. I'm going to think about the destruction of Jerusalem. I know that doesn't seem very cheerful, but there's a whole book in the Old Testament called Lamentations, and it's Jeremiah the prophet, his reflection on the destruction of Jerusalem. Very briefly, Jeremiah had spent most of his ministry as a prophet warning the people of God that if they continued to disobey God, he would bring judgment on them. And they didn't listen. And in the end, Jeremiah had to watch as his words came true in the most dreadful way and Jerusalem was invaded, ransacked and destroyed before his very eyes. Not very cheerful. But... In the midst of his writings about it is one of the most famous passages of the Old Testament and it's a great comfort for those who are going through difficult times because even in the midst of all of that destruction and despair, Jeremiah still found comfort and confidence in God. And this is what he wrote. He said, I remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall, My soul continually remembers it and it is bowed down within me. Perhaps that's how you feel this morning. Perhaps life has knocked you down. You feel just cowered by it all. But this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never cease come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And sometimes when life is at its hardest, what we are called to do is to turn, as it were, inward and upward and remember that our hope, our strength, And our comfort is not found in what is around us, but in our Lord God Almighty, who is above us and who goes before us and who by his Spirit dwells within us. That is our hope and our comfort. So let's sing together our opening hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Let's stand and sing.
Please be seated. And let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, great is thy faithfulness and great is thy mercy to us, your people. Father, we come together this morning as your family here at Hope Baptist in the name of Jesus Christ. And we know that if it were not for your faithfulness and your mercy, there would be nothing to come here and celebrate or worship. But we thank you that through Jesus Christ, you have not only had mercy on us and forgiven us our sins, but adopted us as your children. And so the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Father, is not our God who art in heaven, but our Father. And we thank you that that's only possible through Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. And Father, we thank you too that we can come to you however we are. That whether at the moment life is full of joy and hope or whether life is hard and a struggle, you welcome us as we are, as your dearly beloved children, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, help us to gather this morning, not to be religious, not to pretend, not to th say that everything's okay if it's not, but to come before you as your people, to seek your blessing, to seek your wisdom and your guidance and your help and our strength in all our struggles, but also to proclaim your goodness and your greatness and your glory. And as David would say, why, why are you so cast down within me, O my soul? Bless the Lord. And Father, that's our prayer this morning. Stir our hearts that we might bless your name in all its goodness and glory as you deserve. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Why not take the chance just to turn around and say good morning to someone? Obviously, don't just say good morning to thin air. Just so. Now, some of you will have spotted there are strangers in our midst. So it's lovely to welcome, say, Bob and Rosemary's family, part of Bob and Rosemary's global family that I'm hearing is all over the world. But this particular... Uh, part of the family, now be gent careful my language here, hail from what is alleged to be the rugby capital of the world. So greetings, we've got people, friends from Toulouse in, in France and uh, so if you want to discuss rugby or practice your French, it's lovely to have you with us, Bruno it's good to see you and uh, we hope you have a great time with us this morning. I know Di is itching to, to practice his three sentences of French that he's worked hard on, so we'll give that a go afterwards. But uh, if you're able to stay for tea and coffee, are you? Yeah, it'd be lovely to catch up with you, that's good. That's good. Now, as you will know, Ronwin is away, and she's texted me the notices. So, <laughs> so that there's not many, because most things are on, uh, on the break for summer. However, on Wednesday, we get to say our final farewell to Mike Weldon. Um, it's his funeral at the crematorium. We're not sure if it's 2 or 2.15. I don't know if anyone knows. It's definitely 2.15. Th thank you, Anne. That's brilliant. 2.15 on Wednesday. Now, I need to help Pam out here. She's requested just to get a rough indication of numbers for the wake afterwards. So if you were at the church meeting on Thursday night, I already have your details. That's fine. So if you're at the church meeting, you can just keep your hands down. But for everyone else, if you're planning to go to Mike's funeral and stay for the wake or the <coughs> refreshments afterwards, could you just pop your hand in the air so I can get a... It's one, two, three. Anyone else? It just doesn't stop you going. It's just so that Pam's got a rough idea for the catering. Okay, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, church members meeting. We were unable to get a quorum for the members meeting on Thursday night which basically meant we couldn't have a meeting. So we weren't able to decide anything. Um, and that's a problem because we needed to 
approve our child and vulnerable adult protection policy and were unable to do that. It also meant that we were unable to receive two new people into membership, namely your new pastor and his wife. <laughs> so uh, can I stress that members meetings really are important and uh, it is frustrating for those who turn up when they're unable to have a proper meeting because not enough people have turned up to make it viable or to make it a quorum. So um, under the circumstances, we're going to try something because, because the church would quite like their pastor to be a church member. You know, it's quite helpful, really. Um, we're giving notice of a, of a special church members meeting, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. So give the two Sundays notice. So, not, so a fortnight today immediately after the Sunday morning service, hopefully a five-minute special members meeting with one item on the agenda, which is, are we going to receive the new pastor and his wife into membership? Quite what we'll do if you vote no, I don't know, but, but it will literally be just five minutes and the one item. So if you can, please just stay, be immediately at the end of the service, and we'll make it as quick as we possibly can. Good, I'm just ticking off the list here, sorry, all the stuff I've been given. Right, now as you know, we do like to make a, a little bit of a fuss of the children when it's their birthday. And uh, one particular birthday, which I believe was on Friday, uh, was a young lady named Jean Langdon. Jean, are you here? 92, I believe. Is that right? Well, many congratulations. That's brilliant. Good. Did you have a good day? Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> and would you be terribly embarrassed if we sang happy birthday to you? <laughs> We're going to sing it anyway, sorry. <laughs> so. Hold your breath, because we've got another one. <laughs> this one's a little bit younger. Layla, I believe it's your birthday today. 13? So we'll pray for your mum as the dreaded teens have arrived, though I'm, I'm sure you'll be good as gold. And um, I hope you won't mind me saying this, but I understand you won Pupil of the Year. For religious education, I believe. But well, there you go. So, one of the unexpected benefits of attending a Baptist church, it furthers your education and your career prospects. So, Layla, well done. Good for you. And we hope you have a wonderful day together. And we're going to embarrass you now by singing Happy Birthday. So. And we're going to continue our worship as we take up our offering. And we're going to sing, Come, let us praise the Lord.
pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for Jean, and we thank you for her 92 years of pilgrimage upon this earth. All the things she's seen, all the things she's experienced, and all the blessings, and all the faithfulness and mercy you've shown to her. And we pray, Father, that you would lead her through the year to come, just as you've led her for so many years. And we pray for Layla, and many of us can just remember just what it was like to go through the teens, a time of questions, a time of working out who we are and what we want to do with our lives, and of making friendships. Father, we pray for your blessing on her, not just for the coming year, but for the coming years, as she makes her way through school and then possibly college and university. We pray, Father, you bless her with good friends, friends that will encourage her, friends that will help her to be the best that she can be. And we pray that she will increasingly find that you are there for her, that she knows what it is to have a Father in heaven who loves her and guides her and blesses her through her Saviour, Jesus Christ. And now, Father, as part of our worship, we, we offer this offering to you it comes not only as, as our money, but as a token of a, the pledge of our lives, of our time, of our efforts, of our prayers, to serve you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. So receive and bless this offering, we pray, Father, in his name. Amen. Good, and we're going to continue to pray together. I'm going to pray for some of the issues in our world where people, situations are in need of God's intervention. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we begin with a time of silence as we reflect on our own lives. And before we pray for the world, Father, in the silence of our own hearts, we pray for ourselves, our families, our loved ones. So hear us now, Father, as, as in the quietness and the solitude of our own hearts, we bring to you our needs and the needs of those that we love and care for. Our Father, we bring to you our United Kingdom. And we know that over the coming weeks, a new Prime Minister will be chosen. And some of us struggle with the fact that 160,000 people are going to choose the person that will govern 65 million. And we question whether this is the best way to conduct democracy. But whatever our views on that, Father, we know that by the beginning of September, a new Prime Minister will be in place. And whatever our political leanings, we know that they will face immense challenges, both at home and on the world scene. Father, you already know which man or woman that is going to take up that office. We pray for them now that you will give them wisdom. And we pray that whoever it is, they will be a man or a woman of integrity who puts the needs of the nation over the politics of party. 
Bless them, Father, because we know they will face challenges that most of us, all of us probably, would not know where to start. We pray for those who continue to be caught up in the cost of living crisis. And whether we agree with strikes or not, we, we know it represents working people who are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to pay bills, struggling to provide for families. And our hearts go out to them, not only across this United Kingdom, not only across our principality here in Wales, but right here in Bridge End. With the news this week, Father, that the food bank has now so many clients asking for food that it's giving out more food than it's getting in for the first time in its history. Father, we pray for organisations like Food Bank, like Citizens Advice, and especially organisations like Christians Against Poverty who help people to get out of debt and sort out their finances. But Father, we long for the, a day when such things are not needed. We know that this life is more than the physical and the material, but it's not less than that. You've made us physical, material people, and we need a roof over our head, and we need food in the fridge, and we need to be able to pay our bills. And Father, we long for the day when poverty no longer exists in our nation. We continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine and some of the stories this week, Father, have absolutely shocked us to the core and the sense that we cannot even begin to see how Russia could ever, ever again be rehabilitated as a respected nation on the world stage. We suspect, Father, that some of the atrocities that are being committed are as bad as anything that happened under Stalin or Hitler. And we are appalled that such things could be happening on the doorstep of Europe in the 21st century. Father, we pray that international leaders will continue to stand strong against the oppression and injustice that Russia is meeting out. We pray that violence and aggression will not prevail. We pay for, pray for peace to come to Ukraine and for borders to be re-established and respected. And Father, we pray that the leaders of the free world will say, we must never allow this to happen again. We continue to pray for the people of Sri Lanka a new president and a new prime minister, but no instant answers to the massive problems that they face as a nation. Have mercy on them, Father. And throughout this world, we pray for your church, that wherever your church meets and gathers, Father, they will be beacons of light and hope to their communities around them working to demonstrate the kingdom of God, working to show your love in practical ways, working for peace, working to eliminate poverty and suffering, to bring education and healing, but above all, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the light of the world and the hope of all people. And so, our Father, we bring our prayers together, praying for this world in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Brilliant. Let's sing our next hymn together. 
It's an old hymn that's become a, a sort of modern favourite. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. seated. Just before we uh, look at God's Word together, just to take a moment to, uh, you know when you go to the cinema and you have the trailers of upcoming attractions, just thought we'd uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about August. Um, believe it or not, I, I, it feels like I've been here a lot longer than I have probably feels that way to you as well. Um, I've only actually been leading services for about six, maybe seven weeks, which is, so I'm still kind of finding my feet and uh, working out sort of what fits together and, and, and timings and things and uh, just trying to, how, how it all works. So please bear with me while I sort of uh, find my feet. But one of the things we wanted to do each week was to try and have something in the service at the beginning for the children. And I know 
we've had this discussion, we don't always have children, but the point was to try and make it at least family friendly the first little bit um, so that we're kind of setting out a, a shop window to say that we want to attract uh, children and, and young people and families. I haven't found that as easy to do as I, as I thought, um, so I'm very much open to suggestions. If you have a feel of how we could improve that, please let me know. Um, but one of the things I want to do in August, won't do it next week because when we have communion, we decided not to do a children's slot when we have communion because otherwise the service gets a bit long. But through the rest of August, um, I've come across a, a video, uh, it's only a short video, about the life of Martin Luther, the great reformer. So what we're going to do is just watch that video in a couple of chunks and then after that we're, I'm going to tell you some of the stories about Martin Luther because people don't realise what a great chap he was for all his faults and some of the things that he's brought to the church that even today uh, are part and parcel of what we do. So we owe Martin Luther a lot and I will try and, you know, um, somebody pointed out to me one of my children's talks was obviously aimed at children at university doing a degree. So I will try and, you know, uh, get it down a bit. But we're going to look at Martin Luther because he's a great man and some wonderful stories about him. Um, I'll just tell you one very... No, I won't because time's going. But, well, that's what we're going to do in August. But then preaching-wise, this is my last Sunday of what I wanted to do when I began, which was just to preach about things that were important to me. Just so you knew some of the things that, for me, were central and foundational about how I want to do church and be a pastor. And so what I'm going to do in August, um, we're going to look at some of the great passages about Jesus. Just as an encouragement, there are four or five really wonderful passages that set out the glory, the greatness, the wonder of Jesus, sort of Revelation 1, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, John 1. We're going to look at those through August and just spend August reflecting on the greatness of Jesus. So that's what we're going to be doing. So anyway, this is the last of, of these little messages. We started off with Isaiah 6, when I preached on what I think is possibly the most important thing of all, getting a bigger picture, a clearer picture of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we thought about the need to see ourselves as God sees us and how that changes any, everything, to realise that in Christ we have a new identity as his children, as his people, and how that changes us. So we, we spent a week on that. We thought about revival and about being a church that's prepared for revival, and what that means in practice. And then last week, something that's very dear to me, a church that is serious about living under the shadow of the second coming. Now we've lost that and we need to recover it. To be serious about the fact that we are living for and preparing for and looking for and expecting the day of Christ's return. Today I just want to share with you three scriptures that are very important to me. They're part of who I am and, and, and my faith. And so this is an odd message, three scriptures, and I, I felt, don't be over spiritual, I felt God say that this is what I should share, and then I felt, well, that's unusual, God, are you sure? And I came across a video by Billy Graham entitled, Three Scriptures You Should Know. And I thought, well, if that's not God giving me a nudge, I don't know what is. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come now to look at your word, whether your word is open before us in, uh, in book form, or whether we have it on a tablet or a phone or however we have it, we pray, Father, although we might be listening to my words, in our hearts we will be listening for your words, to be searching the scriptures, to see and hear your voice coming through your word for us, your people. Be with us, have mercy on us, bless us, we pray. And above all, Father, speak to us, your people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Each one of these scriptures has come to me at a different point in my Christian life. And each one of them has been one of those scriptures, and I'm sure you have them as well, scriptures that stand out to you, become dear to you, sort of become part of your faith in a very personal and living way. And the interesting thing is that they're all quite obscure. Many Christians don't know these scriptures. And part of the reason for wanting to share them is actually I think they're not just 
important to me, but I think they're important for all believers to grasp. And the first one is in the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. And you'll find it in Numbers 23. And the setting is that uh, one of Israel's enemies, as Israel wander through the wilderness, one of Israel's enemies has hired a chap called Balak, who's like a prophet for hire. And his job was to go around and either bless people or curse people. Uh, Whoever was paying him decided what he wanted them to do. And he's hired to pronounce curses on the people of Israel. And the only problem is he can't do it. Because every every time he tries to curse them, God changes it to to a blessing. And he... And he suddenly realises, and he goes back in the end, he has to say, I cannot curse this people because they are blessed of the Lord. Which in itself is a wonderful sermon for another day. But um, in chapter 23, as he relates some of this, well, let me read to you from verse 18. And Balaam took up his discourse and said, Rise, Balak, and hear, give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and he will not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless, He has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. Now, there's many great things that can be said about that passage, but here you have this uh, prophet, uh, a man who's respected as having great power and spiritual authority, and basically he says to the man who's hired him, that which God blesses, no one can unbless. That which God blesses, no one can unbless. And I take great comfort from that. There's a, a song that we sometimes sing by Robin Mark. Um, who, and in the, in the song, he, he speaks of commanded blessings. And this is the point, that when God commands a blessing upon his people, no man, no woman, no force of nature, no force of politics, no turn of events, no twists of history... Nothing in all the world can prevent the blessing of God being fulfilled in his people. And the good news for us is that through Jesus Christ, God has commanded that he shall bless his people. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1, verse 1, that is a verse worth memorising and confessing out loud. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, put your name in there, who has blessed me, who has blessed Darren, who has blessed Tracy, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's not withheld anything. In the heavenly realms, where it cannot be overridden, interfered with, stopped or prevented in any way, in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ, God has commanded that every spiritual blessing is already yours. And if you want to know some of them, you can read Ephesians chapter 1, and I've gone through that a couple of times, and depending on how you count them, there's at least seven or maybe eight or maybe nine quite different spiritual blessings that God says that's yours. It's yours in Christ, I've commanded it, I've promised it, it's yours and nothing and no one can ever take it from you. But the real blessing in this passage is in the first part. And it's something I've held on to when times have been difficult, when life has taken twists and turns that I did not expect. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind, as he said... And will he not do it? Or has he spoken? And will he not fulfill it? One of the, the challenges of the Christian life, and if you, if you haven't been through it yet, that can only be because you only became a Christian yesterday, 
if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'll know that one of the challenges is when life around you doesn't work out as you think it should as a Christian. And one of the dangers with that is that we then start to rewrite our image of God in the light of our experience of the day. And that's dangerous. Because if you find yourself going through a bad time, you end up with a bad view of God. And if we're going to be stable in the Christian life, if we're going to endure, if we're going to persevere, we cannot have a belief in God that changes every time our circumstances change. We can't have an understanding of God that varies depending on the weather of our lives. And what we need to hold on to the fact is, whatever is happening in the storms of life around us, God does not lie. What he has spoken is true. What he has promised he will fulfill. What he has said he will do, he will do. The proviso on that is that he doesn't say he'll do it when we want it done, how we think it should be done. And the illustration I always reflect on when I think of that is the story of Paul when he's a prisoner on the ship. And it's in the book of Acts, and the ship gets into this terrible storm, and they fear for their lives. And an angel gets sent from God to say to Paul, don't worry, it's all going to be okay, no one's going to be lost. Paul, God wants you to to, to preach the gospel in Rome. It's all going to be fine. Everyone's going to be safe. And Paul shares that with them. Now, I don't know you, but if I had been writing that story, at this point, Paul would have stood up, prayed out loud, the waves would have subsided, the skies would have parted, the sun would have come out, everyone would have sung hallelujah, and the boat would have sailed nicely into harbour. That's how I would have done it. If you know the story, that's not what happens. The storm gets worse. And it goes on for several more days. And the ship runs aground. It gets caught on a sandbar. And the storm is so bad that the back of the ship, the the bow is stuck on a sandbar, the back of the ship is starting to be smashed apart. And they have to give the order, abandon ship. Everybody dives overboard, hangs on to bits of planks or woods or whatever, and the story concludes that everyone is washed up on shore safely. And you think about that story, you think, as I said, that's not how I would write it. But God didn't say the ship will be all right. God didn't say you'll sail sweetly into harbour and the cargo will be fine and everything will be all right. God's promise was none of you would be lost. And God fulfilled that promise. But he did it his way at his time. And that's what we need to hang on to. We cannot allow the circumstances around us to determine whether we believe God is faithful or not. We believe God is faithful and therefore whatever the circumstances around us, in the end, in his time, in his way, God will fulfill his promises to his people. The man who most helped me to understand this was Colin Urquhart. Uh, He had been an an Anglican uh, priest but he went into the charismatic movement and had a real heart for revival and built a, a really big church and ministry that God blessed and I remember hearing him speaking once and he said, it's about the truth and the facts. Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And what's happening around us every day, that's the facts of our life. Here's the thing, we cannot allow the facts to start altering how we think about the truth. In fact, the facts cannot change the truth. Because Jesus is the truth and he is eternal. The facts won't change the truth. But one day, the truth will change the facts. And that's what we believe and that's what we hope and this is what that verse promises. 
God is not a man. If God's spoken a promise into your life about your children, about your grandchildren, if he's spoken to you maybe about your unbelieving spouse, if he's spoken to you about a situation that you're going through and you've maybe been struggling with for years, if you know God has spoken a promise to you, hear the words, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said and he will do it? Has he not spoken and he will fulfill it? Second key scripture is in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And if you've got the King James Version of the Bible, you're at an advantage here. This is Peter going to Cornelius. This is a very important incident in the book of Acts. The first non-Jew is about to be saved. Cornelius, if you like, is the great, 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 great grandfather of all non-Jewish converts to Christianity. And this was a huge moment for the church. Peter was breaking all the Jewish rules just by going into the house of a non-Jew. I mean, he wasn't supposed to do that. They were unclean. And yet Peter, through an angelic vision, is told this is okay, it's the right thing to do. And when he gets to the house, Cornelius says, well, I was praying and and God sent this angel and said, you need to get Peter to come and tell you about Jesus. And Peter begins with these words. And if you want to know a verse that I would want to build my ministry on, it would be this. And I'll explain why. Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Now that's how the, some of the modern English versions have it. Has anyone got the King James? I would have thought there'd be a lot of people here with the King James or the New King James. Let me tell you how the King, New King James, you've all got the NIV in the pew. The, the King James version, and most scholars I think would say this is, this is getting to the point of what the words mean in Greek. The King James has it. Peter said, I now understand that God is no respecter of persons. I now understand, I now perceive, I think the King James puts it, I now perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That was a pretty outrageous thing for a Jew to say. Because as a Jew he should have said, God is a respecter of persons. People are different and the Jews are at the top of the list. Oh, we're God's chosen people. We've got the Ten Commandments. We've got circumcision. We've got all the laws and the covenants. We're at the top of the list. And everyone else in the world, when the Samaritans, well, they've kind of gone off on a different route and they're accursed. And and the Gentiles, well, they're non... they, they, They don't know God. They're pagans. They're lesser beings. If God is going to work, if God's going to do something, he's going to, he's going to use his people. Of course he is. And Peter, when he's confronted by this Roman centurion, so the leader of an occupying army, and he hears that this man is a devout seeker after God, who's been praying, and there's an angelic vision comes and says, send for Peter so that he might tell you about Jesus. Peter's eyes are opened. And suddenly he realises God doesn't have favourites anymore. Behold, I perceive God is no respecter of persons. Now, why is that important? It means if you got saved, there's absolutely no reason why anyone else can't get saved. If you think, yeah, but you don't know my unbelieving spouse, they would never come to... You just don't know what they're like. With the greatest of respect, I don't care what they're like. Because whatever they're like, God is no respecter of persons. If he saved you, he can save them. Unless you happen to believe your spouse really is the most sin-hardened, evil, evil, wicked human being on the face of the planet. In which case, it would seem to me he's on top of the list of the people that God ought to convert and wants to convert. Because scripture tells us that where the darkness is darkest, God is most eager to bring light. 
You think of all the ex-terrorists and drug addicts and criminals that got saved in prison against all hope. God was saying, look, I can reach anyone. God is no respecter of persons. If he saved you, he can save your children. If he saved you, he can save your boss. Doesn't matter who they are, God is no respecter of persons. It makes no difference to him. If he saved you, he can save them, he can save anyone. But it's also true about things that go on in the church. How often have you gone to spring harvest and heard a wonderful story about this church that's had amazing blessings and I know the youth group grew to 7,000 overnight or something or, you know, they've had 400 baptisms Monday afternoon alone. You know, oh, it's marvellous. But it would never happen here, Lord. It happens in other churches. But it wouldn't happen in Bridge End. Hear the word of God. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. If he did it there, he can do it here. If he blessed that church, he can bless this church. If he moved in that town, he can move in this town. It makes no difference to God. He's no respecter of persons. You know, Nicky Gumbel, the founder of Alpha, a vicar at Holy Trinity Brompton, has just retired. He said, I remember him as a young man with curly hair and a big smile, you know, and he's retired. How did that happen? He's seen amazing things happen. Now, why? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why not. God did not bless Alpha, did not bless Holy Trinity Brompton, did not get bless Nicky Gumbel because he went to Oxford University. Because he had a nice smile and wore, and wore a flash suit. Because he was a clever bloke, because he was a vicar. Any of that stuff... Nothing to do. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care, care whether you've got nice teeth or not. In that sense, it makes no difference. Whether you're tall or short or fat or thin, whether you're well educated or as thick as two short planks, whether you went to Oxford or you went to, you know, never got beyond primary school. God is not a respecter of persons. If you believe in Him, that's all that counts. What did Jesus say? Will the Son of Man find faith when he comes on earth? Not will he find intelligent, good-looking, well-groomed people who know how to lead churches. He's looking for faith. God is no respecter of persons, but he looks into the heart. And if in your heart you believe, that's all that it takes. So why is it that we don't see God doing more things through more ordinary people? Could I offer us a suggestion that it's because we spend most of our time saying, God, you couldn't use me. You couldn't use me. You couldn't bless me. You couldn't use my efforts. You couldn't use my faith. I'm not clever enough. I'm not bright enough. I'm not committed enough. I don't know enough. And we keep putting these barriers up. And God's saying, I'm no respecter of persons. All I'm looking for is people who will believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, that's the start, the middle, and the end. God is no respecter of persons. If he did it there, he can do it anywhere. And he can do it here at Bridge End, and he can do it at Hope Baptist Church. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't need Nicky Gumbel or Billy Graham or Rick Warren or anyone else to come and pastor this church. If we believe the gospel, if we believe in Jesus, God can do it here. One last verse and we're done. It's in Romans 4. Romans 4. And I think, to me personally, this is one of the most beautiful verses about the gospel. And I hope it brings as much comfort to you as it does to me when I'm going through difficult times. Paul is talking about how the fact that we're not saved by works, by religion. We're saved by Christ and faith in him. And he's about to make an outrageous statement. Romans 4 verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as a due or an obligation. But to the one who does not work, 
but believes in him who justifies the wicked. His faith is counted as righteousness. It's the most outrageous statement in the Bible, but it's the best explanation of the gospel. God justifies the wicked. That's the gospel. I say to people, there are no good people in heaven. I don't know if you realise this. There are no good people in heaven. There are only forgiven people. There are only forgiven people. If it came down to goodness, none of us would get there. That's the point of the gospel that we so often fail to grasp. See, Martin Luther, and I told you he was an amazing guy, one of the things he used to say to people was, we think we, think we go to hell because of our bad deeds, but we also go to hell because of our good deeds. Because we do things that we think are good, and we offer them to God as some kind of proof of how good we are. And yet we don't realise how offensive that is to a holy and just and glorious God. Because even our most good acts are miles short of his glorious goodness. And because we offer him our good works, we think we're going to be all right. Because we offer him our good works, we think we don't need a saviour. Because we offer him our good works, we think we'll be all right on the day of judgment, we'll get in. Not realising that it's those very good works that will damn us. Because they are the things that stop us from realising how sinful we are, how far short of God's standards we fall, how sinful we are in the presence of a holy God. It blinds us of our desperate need for a saviour. And as Christians, we need to repent of our good works as well as our bad works. And if that sounds a bit weird, let me explain it to you. How often have you come to God and felt or said, I'm a really bad Christian because I've not prayed much this week or I've not read my Bible for a few days? As if somehow God's going to say, well, you know, if only you'd been reading your Bible and praying every day, I would be kind to you. But what, what, how do you expect me to treat you? you? You haven't prayed for a few days? Oh, that's absolutely outrageous. No, when you come to God, and we've, we've got to get this because it's the gospel. When you come to God, it doesn't matter whether you have prayed yesterday, the night before, or not prayed for a week. God doesn't accept you on the basis of whether you've prayed recently or not. He accepts you on the basis of the fact you're his child because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. And to try and come before God on any other basis is to offend his grace. Now, does God want you to pray more? Of course he does. Does God want you to read his word? Of course he does. Does he love you any more when you do those things? No. No. How could he? How can he love you any more than he already loves you because he sent his only son to die for you? So does God love you any less when you don't do those things? You know, God's love for you does not go like that depending on whether your behaviour goes like that or whether your spiritual life goes like that. God's love for you is like that all the time. Because it's bought with the blood of Jesus. So when you come to God and you get on your knees, the only thing to say, say I mean, whether you, whatever you're struggling with, God accepts you and welcomes you in that moment because you're his child through Jesus Christ. And whatever you've done has already been forgiven because it's under the blood of Jesus. That's the God I believe in, the God who justifies the wicked. So I'm quite open with you. As your pastor, I'm wicked. <laughs> I am. You know, John Stott, the great Anglican preacher, on his 80th birthday, 
said to his friends and colleagues, this is all well and good, but if you could look into my heart, you would spit in my face. All of us struggle with sin. All of us struggle with a dark side. All of us struggle with destructive and ungodly patterns of behaviour, some of which we've been struggling with 20, 30, 40 years. We do not believe in a God who justifies the good. We believe that there is and are no good people aside from Christ. We confess that we are lost, that we are wicked, that we are sinful, that we are broken. And that in all of these things, God loves us. And through Jesus Christ, and that's the key, through Jesus Christ, he forgives us. And he accepts us. And he takes us as we are. And he begins to make us who he wants us to be. And his love for us in all of that alters not one iota. Whether we go up or down. Or up or down. He is the God who justifies the wicked. You know, I've never quite been this cheeky. But I've almost wanted to pray on occasions. Hi Lord. <laughs> it's the wicked here again. I'm so grateful that you justify men like me. Because if you didn't justify the wicked, I could not be on my knees talking to you now. Three scriptures that teach us three important truths about God. That he does not lie. What he has said, he means. What he's promised, he will do. What he has said, he will do, he will fulfill. That he is no respecter of persons. That he's as likely to use you as anyone else. He's as likely to bless this church as any other. He's as likely to move in Bridge End as anywhere else. And if he's saved you, he can save anyone that you know and love and pray for. And that he is a God who is so amazingly gracious and so abundantly merciful that he justifies the wicked. Men and women like you and me who don't deserve any of this. But it's not about what we deserve. It's about what's in God's heart. It's not about what we've earned. It's about what he has done for us in Jesus. Our testimony on the day of resurrection when we stand before him will not be, this is what I deserve. It will be, I don't deserve any of this. All glory, all thanks, all blessing, all honour, all tribute, all worth goes to you, God. Because in your amazing grace through Jesus Christ, you saved me. Let's sing our closing hymn together. Paul didn't know what I was going to preach on when he, uh, when he picked this hymn. He was obviously divinely inspired because we're going to finish with To God be the glory, great things he has done.
Father, we thank you that you are a God who justifies the wicked, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Father, we know that is the testimony of our lives. And so, Father, as we go from here, we pray that the peace and the joy and the comfort that this message brings will be ours in the coming week. And so may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest on us all until he gather us again. Amen. Did all loss to gain Christ alone. Lamb that was slain, receive your reward. For you were worthy. You were worthy. Bring it back here. We're always looking for good ideas. And, but do take our greetings to whichever church you go to and have a wonderful holiday. It all lost to gain Christ alone. Lamb that was slain, receive your reward. For you were worthy, you were worthy, Lord, you were worthy, you were worthy, Lord, you were worthy.